You've heard the stories like that of Job, who in the Bible had everything a man could want, and then he lost it all suddenly and tragically. What happens though, when those Bible stories get out of the pages of the Bible and find their way into the lives of everyday people? I'm here in everywhere USA. It could be where you live, regular people living regular lives. And it's here where I'm gonna speak with Karen Johnson, whose life was struck by terrible random tragedy, but then God turned that into triumph through the power of His grace. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Karen, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. You're welcome. It had been a, a perfect day. Your husband, John, and yourself had had a great day. And then, and then in the evening. In the evening, we decided that we were going to go out on our date night. We hadn't had a date night in quite some time. And I was very, very excited. I had just got my hair done the day before. And we decided that we were going to do three things. We were going to go to out to a restaurant to eat first because I told them I was hungry. Then from there, we were going to go to a friend's house and we were going to spend some time with a friend. And then we were going to cap it off by going to my mother's house. She had just had her birthday four days prior to Saturday and we hadn't seen her. And so that, that was the plan. So things were going great. What happened later on that evening? As we drove out of our particular development, we got into the main street, which is called Bruceville. We headed on down Bruceville and he told me to pick the restaurant. And so... Elk Grove is at that time was a, a lot smaller city than what it is now, but we had a few restaurants. We had Fridays, we had Chili's, we had Red Robin. As we turned the corner, John, my husband kind of sat back in his seat and he said, honey, this is going to be a great year. And I said, really? He said, yes. And I, that was like music to my ears because we were a blended family. We had our struggles. And for him to say, honey, this is going to be a great year, it, it was one of the best things that a wife could hear from a husband, right? As we're continuing on down, I saw another restaurant, but I decided, no, I'm a vegetarian. And I thought, probably not a very big selection of vegetarian food, so we kept going. And then I turned to my right and I noticed this restaurant. It was a new restaurant, a sports grill. And I said, honey, how about Mandango's? And he said, what is Mandango's? I said, it's a new sports restaurant. And he said, really, had you ever been there? And I said, no. And so he said, let's go. And so I pulled into the parking lot. It was pretty crowded and it was dark. So I parked on the opposite side, right in front of the Asian market. And we hopped out of the car and walked into the restaurant. A great evening. Things are looking good. It's going to be a great year. Uh, you ended up where you ended up sort of randomly. You could have been in any other, a number of any other places. That is true. So you went in there and you spent your evening. Things are looking good. The future is looking bright. And then a random event took place. Well, when I got inside of the restaurant, immediately my spirit didn't feel right. I had, we had a wonderful day and uh, spiritual themes. And I walked into the restaurant and all I could hear was music. And I could see the TV screens all around the restaurant. And it really wasn't what I expected for date night. People laughing, drinking, and I wanted to leave. But as I turned and looked at him, I noticed him looking at the TV screen. And when I saw that, I thought, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to mess it up for him. I don't want to be selfish. And so I didn't say anything. And he said, honey, there's a seat right over, there's a table right over there. And we walked and we sat down. We ordered. He um, was really into the game, more into the game than me, and I was feeling a little jealous, but I knew that we were going to spend time over. His friend's name was uh, Dwayne Witherspoon, so we were going to go to Dwayne's house, and we were going to go see my mother. So I figured I would have 
enough quality time with him by the time the date was over. And then, as you do, people leave the restaurant. Yes. You'd mentioned how you've started to feel in the, in the restaurant. Not everything was perfect, and I don't know if that was a portent of things to come. But when it was time to leave, walk us through what happened next. It's a very good point. Very good point. Well, halfway through the meal, out of nowhere, my husband says, uh, Honey, we're not going to be able to see Mom. And I thought, excuse me? He says, we're not going to be able to go, go over mom's house. And I said, why? He said, because we don't have enough time. So I just immediately asked the waitress to come on over and please give us a ticket so that we can go. And life is about to change. Yes. In the most terrible and drastic way that a person could imagine. I've read your book and it recounts the story. Yes. You went to the parking lot. You got into your car sat in the driver's seat, ready to drive. Mm -hmm. John did not immediately get in the car. He was on the phone. And while he was on the phone, you heard him say something. I did. I heard him say, spoon. And when he said spoon, I thought, oh, they're just joking back and forth because him and his friend would always joke. My husband was a, a jokester. They jo he joked about and laughed about everything. So he said, spoon. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, they're talking. And then he said, man, get that out of my face. And so when I heard him say, man, get that out of my face, I thought maybe his friend cracked a joke or something. And he said, oh, man, get that out, you know. And then I heard, pow. And I just sat there. You didn't respond. I did not respond. I, I, I just sat there. What went through my mind, what I can recall went through my mind was, okay, South Sac is a little ways. That happened out there. That, that didn't happen here. I, I, I didn't, you know. So I heard it, but I just discounted it as being maybe something that happened way off in the distance. And I just sat there. When I didn't hear anything, I turned and I looked to my right, and he wasn't there. Again, I went back to my forward position, just looking. After a few seconds, I, again, I don't know how long it was, I turned and I looked over to my left, and when I looked to my left, I saw this man with a shotgun on his shoulder, like this, pointing up to the sky. And when I saw that, immediately everything started coming back. Uh, sp spoon, man, get that out of my face, the silence. And then I saw the guy walking with a shotgun. Immediately I said, he's been shot. He's, he, he's been shot. And what did you do? Immediately, I opened up the car door to run around to find, to find my husband. When I opened up the car door, he turns around, the murderer, the person that with the shotgun, he turned around with like robotically and he looked right at me in my direction. And when he did, I ducked. I, I ducked because I, I just knew one, he saw me and two, he was going to come back and finish me off. And what kept going through my mind is I can identify him. He saw me, he's going to come back and he's going to kill me. So I was paranoid. So I'm, I'm shaking and I'm ducking so that he won't see me. But I, I see him. I saw him the whole time and I'm just shaking. And I truly believe that I was praying. I can't tell you what I was saying, but I just, all I could remember thinking is he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. When he didn't see me, he turns around again, very robotically. And he starts walking away from the car. And when he did that, I knew then that that was the best time ever to get out and find out where my husband was. So I immediately jumped out of the car and I ran around to the passenger side. And I could not believe what I saw. My husband was laying there on his back with his eyes closed. And all I could see was his juggler vein pumping. That's all I could see. And all I could think is if I, if I just stay there, he's gonna, he's gonna die. He's not, I need to get help. And I just ran and I darted out quickly and I ran back into the restaurant. Let me ask you, at that moment, how much hope did you have that John was gonna survive, that John would live? Or were you even thinking about that? All I was thinking about was getting help. At that moment, I thought that if I got help, he would live. So yes, I did have some hope there. But when I got inside the restaurant, it was very difficult for me to get the attention of the patrons and or the management there because of the music was so loud, the TVs were blaring, 
people were laughing and I started screaming out. I started screaming and I started saying, my husband's been shot. And when I said my husband's been shot, nobody heard me. And so I changed my plea and I said, call 911. My husband's been shot. And when I said call 911, there were two men, they were sitting at the bar, but they heard me and they turned around and they said, they came over to me and they said, what? I said, my husband's been shot. I said, there's a man outside. He's shooting. He's shooting. My husband's been shot. They immediately ran outside with me and I pointed to our car and I said, he's there, you know, showed him my husband, but they could still hear the guy was shooting in the air and you could hear round after round going off in the air and they could hear the shooting. And after we were out there, I told them I'm gonna, I took off, I was gonna run back to my husband's side and they said, ma'am, no, you can't go. And I said, why? They said, because it's too dangerous. I said, but he needs me. They says, no, ma'am, you need to go back inside. And I was like, why, why, why he needs me? However, uh, the Lord knew that we were going to be there that night. He knew we were going to be there. And so there were Christians in that restaurant. There were believers. There were praying people in that restaurant. And they started coming around me and they started laying their hands on me and they started comforting me, praying for me, telling me, just comforting me. And it wasn't long after that you received word or it was inferred to you that your husband wasn't going to make it. It was inferred to me. Later, minutes later, I guess maybe a half hour or so later, I don't know, this other lady walked up to me. She was a nurse. And she walked up to me. She stood right in my face. I remember this. And she said, um, ma'am, I tried to give him CPR, but they wouldn't let me. And she just did this. And she walked away. And, and when you she did that, I knew. When she did this, I said, he's not going to make it. What do you do? You're full of hope. This year is going to be a great year. And that very night, randomly, everything ends. And the life of the one you love most is tragically, senselessly, and brutally ended. And then you've got to go ahead and make a choice. Am I going to live my life and put the pieces back together or is this going to destroy me also? Karen was confronted by that choice. Let's find out in just a moment how she responded when the question was asked of her. In Matthew 4, 4, the Word of God says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed especially for busy people like you. Look for Every Word on selected networks or watch it online every day on our website, itiswritten.com. Receive a daily spiritual boost. Watch Every Word. You'll be glad you did. Here's a sample. Astronomers in Australia announced a few years ago that they calculated the number of stars in the sky. 70 sextillion. That's 70,000 million million million. 70 followed by 22 zeros. That's more stars than there are grains of sand in all the Earth's deserts and beaches. And the astronomers say their number is likely way too low. In Psalm 8 verses 3 and 4 we read these words, When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? God has made a universe that vast, and yet he is still mindful of the human family. We serve a great and a big God. If he made all that, and he did, you can be certain he can take care of you and your burdens today. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Let's live today by every word. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 1-800-992-2219. Call today or visit our special website, www.hislegacy.com.
On March 25, 2006, Karen Johnson's life was changed forever. She and her husband John had enjoyed an evening together when John's life was tragically and brutally cut short by a man high on methamphetamines, wielding a shotgun and carrying a satanic Bible. I don't think it's very hard for you and I to imagine the sorts of emotions Karen might have felt after that awful event. Anger, I don't know, malice, bitterness. We can imagine these things. But Karen was confronted with a choice. Do you let your life fall apart? Do you fall into a pit of despair and bitterness and hate? Or somehow, do you try to piece your life back together again and go on with your head held high and your dignity intact? Karen, that's the decision you were confronted with. What was your response to that decision or that question when it was asked of you? Yeah, it, it was very difficult, of course. <clears throat> it was numerous things that continued to happen as I was grieving through the process. One of the most difficult things for me was to be able to come to terms, come to grips, that my life has changed forever. I felt so displaced. I felt like someone I could really relate to Joseph being thrown in the pit. I could relate to Job when he lost everything just in the twinkling of an eye. It was just all gone. Um, those stories, believe it or not, John, um, helped me somehow to uh, bring perspective to what I was dealing with myself. I couldn't even breathe. I couldn't even imagine living past my next breath. It was just that hard. It was that difficult. But I knew that I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to die. And I knew I had to put my life back together again. Now, as a Christian, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be able to lean on Jesus. Yes. But as a Christian, we go through this life thinking that, well, God is going to protect me. God is going to keep harm from coming to me. Yet in his whatever we're going to call it, providence or wisdom or all knowingness, God allowed this tragedy to strike. Were there moments you were, you were angry with God? No. No anger with God? No. Which is a remarkable thing. No. What kind of conversations did you have with God? Why? I needed to know why. I wanted to know why. I needed to know why. But I wasn't angry because I know that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and all of that. I knew that. I, I, I know about this great controversy between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. I knew that. So somehow I realized that I was a part of this great controversy. Now what do I do with this? And so I purposed in my heart to turn evil into good. But it wasn't easy. And it was a process. It had to be a monumental struggle. All I wanted to do was bring glory and honor to God. That's what I wanted to do. The funeral, just at the funeral, everything that was happening. I wanted to put my husband away in decency and in order. And it was a decision that I had to make. My sister said something to me. She says, you know, you come from, from a very strong family. And so I thought about that. You know, then again, I thought about my relationship with Christ and things like that. So I think all of that and the people that rallied around me helped. So instead of this pushing you away from God, like it would for so many people, this event drew you, urged you even closer to God. More than ever before. And you were able to find strength from God in a, in a, in a senseless, terrible situation. I was. And as I said, the big question for me was why? Why John? Why me? Why now? Why did this have to happen? Why? And he revealed a lot of things to me over the year. Over the years, he revealed a lot of stuff to me. But that was the big question. So I wasn't angry. I just wanted to know why. And it, it, and it drew me closer to him. I turned into him instead of turning away from him. Something you just said, and it comes out in your book, Covered and Kept. Uh -huh. Forgiveness is a process. Yes. So you were able to bring yourself um, to a healthy place. Yes. But it didn't happen just like that. No, it did not. No, not at all. One of the things I am into health and fitness and I, and I follow the eight laws of health and I teach, you know, health reform to my, my students and my classes and stuff like that. And so I had to put all of this together. When it happened, I, 
I didn't want to exercise. I had lost 16 pounds in like a week and a half. I was very weak. I was very distraught, but I knew that I had to start practicing again the principles that I was teaching and preaching to my, to my students. And if you were ever going to be whole, if you were ever going to be complete, if you were ever going to be a functioning, successful Christian, yes, you were going to have to make a decision regarding forgiveness. And in just a moment, Karen's going to talk with us and tell me how she was able to wrestle with the idea of forgiving the man who murdered her husband. And she'll tell us whether or not she was able to forgive. I'll be right back. Perhaps our program today has touched your heart and impressed you with a personal need for deeper Bible study. If you desire to listen to God and follow where He leads, we've got a wonderful resource that can help you do that in a systematic way. The Discover Bible Guides. These study guides will take you through the essential truths taught in Scripture. They give you the big picture, showing how it all fits together. The Discover Bible Guides are a wonderful way for you to become grounded in the Word of God and to see how Jesus Christ relates to all the areas of our lives. Please call or write us, and the Discover Bible Guides will be on their way to you. If you live in North America, we'll mail these Bible Guides free of charge. Or for easier and immediate access from anywhere around the world, you can get these wonderful Bible lessons on our website, itiswritten.com. Request the Discover Bible Guides by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now and tell us the name of today's free offer, the Discover Bible Guides. Lines are open 24 hours. If they're busy when you call, keep trying. You can also request today's offer by writing to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91359. If you wish to support the worldwide outreach of It Is Written, your tax-deductible gift may be sent to the same address. Or you can make a gift online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your letters and for your continued support. Our toll-free number is 1-800-253-3000 and our web address is itiswritten.com. Karen, as a Christian, you're going to start wrestling with the question of forgiveness. Uh -huh. Even forgiving the man mm -hmm. who brutally took the life of your husband. Yeah. And as you wrestled with that, God brought you to this place, to this cemetery, and spoke to you here. Yes, He did. How yes, did He, he did. Through His Word, one, speaking to my heart, I just kept being pulled here. And I couldn't understand why. I would go to an appointment with my mental health therapist, and right after that appointment, I would come right here to the cemetery. Uh, and I would stand here, right, right where we're standing. And I, kn I know he's dead in the grave. I know that. But I was talking to the Lord. I was praying. And I was asking him to show me how to forgive. And John, I had more than one person to forgive as well. But uh, it was here at the cemetery I was able to find that, that peace. And Karen, it was in the courtroom the day the man who murdered your husband was sentenced. Yes. God gave you the opportunity impressed upon your heart to do something most of us would find absolutely remarkable. How did that work out? Well, again, I didn't know what I was going to say. And my girlfriend prayed and said, let's allow Jesus, the Lord, to put the words in your mouth. And everything was orchestrated where I would be the only person who would speak on that day to share with the judge, the courtroom, and the defendant how I was impacted. I did not know where I was going to go. I started off with independence, but in the end, I looked him in the eye, the murderer, and I told him I forgave him. I went on to tell him I do not condone. Don't, 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 get, it, don't get it wrong. I don't condone what you did, but I said it a second time, I forgive you. Now, up until that point, he was very, he, he showed no remorse whatsoever, and that was the first reaction, first reaction we got to show us that there was, that he had somewhat of a heart, you know, and he said, thank you. Not audibly, but with his lips, he said, thank you. I read in your book, Covered and Kept, he, he yes. said thank you to you, not one time, but, but twice. But twice, but twice. I know you're gonna understand what I mean when I say this. If there's anyone in this world who did not deserve forgiveness, it's the man who murdered your husband. He was in the wrong. 
We could, we could go through a whole long list of things. Yes. From a human point of view, he didn't deserve forgiveness. Mm -hmm. But that's not the standpoint you were operating from. It was not. It was not. And I know now, and I knew then, why God kept sending me here to the cemetery. Because every time, as I drove around here crying, sad, grief, remorseful, depressed, I was playing Via Dolorosa, as a matter of fact, Jamie George. I would listen to that, tears rolling down my face, and what I could see was Jesus hanging on the cross. That's what he showed me. That's what I could see. He didn't die just for me and you, but he died for the Aaron Duns of the world, those people that are murdering and, and do wrong. And uh, again, there are consequences to our actions, and I wanted him to understand that. But also I wanted him to understand that he has an opportunity to give his life to Christ if he chose. And that was the message that I believe God wanted me to share with him at that time. That's the message of grace. The same mercy that God has shown sinners like me. Yes. You then extended and demonstrated yes. to this man, guilty, sentenced to death. Yes, sentenced to death. That's right. But you showed him grace, mm -hmm. forgiveness, pardon, undeserved. Yes. It's one of the powerful things about your story, mm -hmm. how it played out down at this end of the story. Yes. It mirrors what God has done for me and you, what God has done for everybody. Yes. Yes. Thanks, thanks for sharing your story with me. Yes, and thank you. Thank you so very much. Yes. You know, friend, God is a God of great grace, a God of great mercy. He is a God of justice, but He's a God who is good. There are people in this world, and you are one of them, who do not deserve forgiveness, who do not deserve goodness, who do not forgive grace, but God through His Son, Jesus Christ, has come to this earth to offer us pardon, forgiveness, cleansing, and wholeness, even though we do not deserve it. God has offered that to us. Let's pray together now and thank God for that goodness, for that grace. Yes. Let's pray together. Yes. Our Father in heaven, we can just say thank you today because you are good. When we are not, you are great and good and right. And I thank you that to the sinners of this world, you offer grace, you offer pardon, you offer forgiveness. We don't deserve it. But as Karen has demonstrated, grace is so powerful when it is not deserved. And Lord, I wish that it will have a powerful effect in our lives now. Bless us, please, for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me today. And until we meet again next time, please remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.